what I found in the field is even using multiple stage filter, you are quite successful in suppressing noise between the lower frequency range as we discussed, but for higher frequency, that is less effective. But if you look at the power application, there is no such device that works effectively all the way to more, more than 30 or 40 megahertz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I am very happy to be speaking with Min Zhang today, independent EMC consultant based in the UK. Uh, today, we'll be talking about EMC both on the board and off the board, and I think it will be a very interesting discussion because it lets us look a little bit more at the system level. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been my pleasure, Zach. Yes, uh, so I believe the first time we had uh, been involved in the same event, but uh, had not, I don't think, actually had a chance to speak to each other was at an EMC Live event last year. Um, you were talking about uh, EMC uh, in automotive, and uh, I was talking radar, so a little bit, uh, <laughs> a bit of worlds apart here, but um, it's actually uh, nice to finally talk to you uh, directly. Yeah. Same here. So, uh, with with uh, thank you. Um, so, with you being uh, newer on the, the podcast, um, maybe you can introduce yourself to the audience, and then um, maybe describe some of your experience, and then how did you get into uh, the EMC world? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for the uh, brief introduction. So, um, I have been running a very small um, you know, consulting engineering consulting business, but mainly focusing in the field of EMC for uh, just about over two years now. And um, before before that, I have been working for uh, big companies as a motor control or motor drive engineer and power electronics design engineer for, for more than, I think, eight or maybe 10 years. Uh, it depends on how you count it. And, uh, and uh, before that, uh, I was in the uh, university uh, doing uh, research. Uh, so I completed my PhD and uh, the topic is, is about a switching scheme on a, on a three phase four leg voltage source inverter. Um, and that, that was, a, I think the first time I really looked into uh, the EMI issues, particularly related to how how you switch the converter and how bad the, the impact could be in, in, in a system level like that. Um, I, I think lots of um, people who listen to this podcast uh, at one point would have uh, EMI issues because that's just an inherent problem <laughs> with designing either a PCB or a system. Um, uh, it's, it's, it has always been a challenging uh, task, I guess. Um, lots of people treat it as black magic or dark art. Um, I think I think lots of lots of um, experts have have explained to this about this issue. So basically, it's it's a combination of lack of education in the university and also some some uh, old way of thinking. Thinking, you know, following a do's and don'ts list. Actually, uh, those lists probably is wrong, uh, considering how fast uh, the modern switches uh, goes and modern uh, system is. So, uh, the the uh, I got interested in in the field of EMC mainly because um, uh, it was in the university when I was doing my my PhD. I have my best friend uh, Andrew. He he has a, a very good project to work on. It's, it's uh, uh, it's, it's, the project is about monitoring the capacitor uh, against the charging discharging performance and using that information to predict um, the failure of a capacitor. And it's used for a fault tolerant uh, application in, a, in an aerospace. And um, his, his research has been going on well um, in terms of the simulation works, the low voltage um, uh, rig works. But when he was trying to implement in, in a high power, high voltage rig, and it, it simply couldn't work simply because of the, the huge noise source uh, it is involved because it is a motor drive system. And as you can imagine, when the converter starts driving a, a big power motor and you get noise everywhere. And um, the, because our university 
it specialized in, in motor and power converted design. So, you know, we got the best professor in the field. But I was really surprised to see that even the best lecturer and professor in the field had no solution in terms of fixing the EMI issues. So that was time when I realized, okay, so this is a serious problem. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I got interested in, in it. And the problem, my, my friend's problem, was eventually solved with the help of his father, actually. His father worked as a principal engineer in European Space Agency. So he had really to fl fly from uh, uh, Holland at the time to the UK and bringing him, you know, a, a special case. I still remember that uh, suitcase, which involves, you know, spectrum analyzer, lots of ferrites and cable shielding, copper tape. And that was the first time when I saw a, a, a you know, proper EMI diagnosis kit myself and I, I was so fascinated about it and actually I, it was a weekend I remembered I was really just observing how his father took step-by-step -step approach to fixed issues that was the first time I saw you know a proper EMI diagnosis or troubleshooting process including checking the grounding checking the bonding and apply ferrites at the right place and um and yeah lots of things using uh, copper tape so i guess that event that single event really sparked my interest in the field so uh so since then yeah i have i've been uh, working intensively in this field mm. so this is very interesting because you said something uh that I'll, well pretty much every old school high speed designer has said which is that um you know the old uh, do's and don'ts list or the old rules of thumb stop working because mm. uh, the system runs so fast, uh, meaning edge rate. Mm. But um, you're really saying the same thing in terms of EMC uh, and EMI. And uh, I I know that the two are related, of course. Um, I think not everybody does. But um, it, it sounds almost like you're implying that the best design practices possibly for high-speed digital really are actually best EMI EMC practices. Yeah, I guess you can you can safely say so. Um, obviously now the EMC the subject of EMC now expanded to not only limited EMC but also CP as signal integrity and power integrity. I guess that's uh, where lots of our engineers are focusing at the minute, you know, high speed design and things like that. But um, you know, a uh, strange thing is lots of people uh, find me as a very practical guy solving EMC issues. But actually, if there's any recommendation I could give to a design engineer, that would be really understand the fundamentals, because only if when you understand the fundamentals, um, you know, un understand the basics and the first principle, then you can really design a system. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, or that's, I guess, in the videos that I that I make. Um, some of those questions that we get really always go back to some of those same fundamentals. And I think it's one of those yeah. things where you have to look at it from 10 different perspectives until you can actually suss out what is the right approach that can help you address many of those issues. And I've found it mm -hmm. most of the easy EMI problems to solve relate to stack up, defining ground, so grounding, like you've said, and then routing mm -hmm. properly. And a lot of the yeah. easy stuff can be solved that way, which might be 50 or 75% of problems. But eventually the problems span beyond just how did I route this trace on the board? And it seems like you're looking also at all of those other problems because I'm sure they're related to how you create the circuit board and with the stack up and everything. But at some point they exist off the board and they interfere with the system or they just create so much noise that the system is never gonna pass EMC. Yeah, that is a that is a good point. I actually, have a, a a good case study here to show. So exactly as you said, um, if we look at a PC, just a, a bare PCB board design, then apply all the techniques um, like stack up, routing, and um, future design. If you design the future properly, uh, that would probably contain the noise on the board level. Then the next challenge is. 
if you have multiple boards in the system level, then you will always end up with connectors and cables between PCBs. And that starts a, another issue basically is where is your ground? Because we are very familiar with the topic of, you know, one ground. Now, um, I, I think lots of people have been quite familiar uh, with this topic if they watch the uh, Ricky Hartley's uh, uh, famous YouTube video about grounding two hour long. So that's all talking about ground in a PCB level. But then when you have three or four PCBs and then they interconnect uh, with data line, power line, signal lines, and they all have different zero volts, let's say. Let's just make sure that yeah, they are not really ground ground, but zero volts. So you will always end up high frequency um, potential difference uh, uh, between the two or three zero volts. Um, a typical example, actually, is if you look at a, 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 a motor drive application, let's say, and if it's a three-phase uh, brushless DC motor drive, uh, make this simple, um, you have a, a, a converter circuit and you have a motor. So in this case, we often treat the zero volts or ground in the system um, as the negative DC link uh, uh, bus. So if you, if you have electrolytic capacitors connecting between positive uh, DC and negative DC, then that negative DC is often um, considered as a uh, zero volts reference or ground reference. Then you got, of course, you, then you have uh, three half bridges. And then these, uh, in the middle point of these half bridges, you connect it to the three phase winding of a motor. But then this happens, what happened was the motor itself is floating compared to this zero volts. Then you ended up lots of noise and uh, that's a typical motor drive application noise. And it's, it's, it's always, has always been a problem because it's, it's broadband and it, it, it's everywhere and you, you just need to suppress it. So one effective way uh, we found uh, is to ground the frame. So when we say ground the frame, so in, in, in a much larger system, you might find actually, so you have the converter um, bonded to a, a common chassis plane and then perhaps two or three meters or even 20 or 30 meters away, you have the motor frame bonded to the same chassis. So that's basically just trying to make sure that the two uh, references point have more or less the same potential. Uh, um, so that will often work. But as, you know, as we talked now, even uh, motor drive circuit used to be the case of Switching frequency five kilohertz IGBT. That's that's just the standard technology back in uh, ten or twenty years ago. Modern days, we have silicon carbide or GAN devices, so which switch much faster with uh, a lot faster rising and falling time. Then, run using the same trick, running a long distance will give you lots of trouble, and you probably won't be able to uh, to solve the EMI issues. So in this case, we really need to treat things differently um, in terms of design. So this is a good a good topic to to bring up uh, because now we're talking about you know the fundamental change in the actual circuit itself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you know a switch from IGBT to eventually MOSFETs and now silicon carbide and GAN, um, which is not just a motor drive thing. It's now also you know an RF thing. Um, so finding you know, those those components are finding a home in multiple places. Um, but what, what actually needs to change in that type of application where you have, like, as you say, maybe the motor drive or the, you know, motor is far and away from the actual control board. And in this case where let's say you have the control board and its power system, and maybe there's a digital subsystem or whatever, I think it's easy to shield the boards, right? Like you say, maybe you put mm -hmm. them in a chassis and you can shoot, you know, it's a shielded chassis or whatever it is. And it's connected to a frame ground and then it's uh, you know, you've got a, you've got a safety safety enclosure around that those boards um but what then happens with something that is running out of a cable and is connected to like you say maybe it's a motor maybe it's some other system outside of the that's outside of the shielding what, what do we do about that yeah so this is a very good question because ideally with modern technology as we just discussed you would always want to put the converter next to the motor that's perhaps the easiest 
and the most efficient way of solving our problems. But applications, you know, um, that, that, that's basically, you know, what determines your configuration or your topology is always the product application. There are some applications where you simply cannot put the converter next to the motor. For instance, if the motor is a small size motor put in a very tight space in a, in a, in a, in a product, and they, they, they have to, to use long cables. So that's becoming very, very challenging, as you said. Uh, we can always run a gardening cable next to the, 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 the motor face wire, but that's not effective as we discussed with the high frequency stuff. Shielding is, is a good solution. Uh, so not only do you need to shield the, uh, the converter side, mainly, mainly to connect that shielding end to the zero loss reference, as we discussed, is, which is often the negative DC link. And you, will also, you also need to connect the shield to the motor frame. So that's, that's easier said than done because uh, the shield would increase cost, weight, and also the bending ratio would be affected. And, um, and it's sometimes you, if, you, if you're not terminating it properly, you, you ended up with a, a, a still bad product. So that's, that's, the, that's the challenge we're facing at this stage. There is, because as I said, the, the, the fundamental, if you understand the fundamental, you will know that it's, it's now in this case, the cable with linking the converter and the motor becomes a, a transmission line because it's just uh, very long. And you really need to, to think carefully when you, when you design a system uh, as this, yeah. So you, you brought up a couple of, of good points here because you know, you're talking about noise pickup on a cable. And um, I think most designers um, who may not be familiar with this particular application will hear, oh, noise is being picked up on a cable. Well, I need to attach like a ferrite choke to it or a ferrite, a ferrite ring to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. you know, you look at like power cords, let's say, coming into your, to your computer or whatever, mm -hmm. and they have one of those on it. Um, so mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's easy to say, well, it works here, so it should work there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me what's wrong with that thinking. <laughs> or is that the right thinking in this yeah, case? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that thinking is still, still uh, valid. It's a valid thinking. Um, I think, yeah, again, using the, the same case study, uh, the motor drive control, let's say, the, the, there, there are two, actually two challenges here. Because even with the uh, fast switching devices such as silico carbon and the GAN device, the majority of the noise that um, uh, the motor drive uh, circuit creates is still uh, within the range of a few uh, a few hundred kilohertz up to a, uh, five megahertz, and then then of course then the the noise profile will be seen in in a much higher frequency range. Um, the challenge here is you can always design a good filter on your board. For example, you could design uh, for a three phase motor. You could design a, a, a three phase LC filter. And you might say, okay, that's not enough. Let's design three-phase LC filter. That's as a first stage. And then after that, we're gonna have a three-phase common mode choke plus some uh, Y caps. So that would be serving a high frequency filtering uh, as the second stage. Um, but what I found in the field is even using multiple stage filter, you are quite successful in suppressing noise between the lower frequency range as we discussed. But for higher frequency, that is less effective because if you look at all the data sheets of, uh, say, a, a common mode choke, because again, this is used for a high power application. We're not talking about a CAN bus design because, for example, a CAN bus design, they are, they are, they are always common mode choke, which works quite effectively uh, above, beyond hundreds of megahertz. But if you look at the power application, there is no such device that works effectively all the way to more, more than 30 or 40 megahertz. So often we found actually the ferrite technique still works because that's a, a very effective way of suppressing the noise at 100 or 200 megahertz. So you ended up having a properly designed filter on the board that is mainly designed for suppressing the noise in the lower frequency range. And then you, you plus uh, 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 a ferrite 
that would suppress the high high, high frequency range noise. That's that's what I was hoping you were going to say. Is it's not just one component that's like the magic bullet for every single noise source mm -hmm. because the noise is broadband. You have to think about what do I do to attack the high frequency range. That's the ferrite application. The low frequency range is much better attacked mm -hmm. with the uh, with a filter, as you've said, like a filter circuit. And then it seems to me though mm -hmm. that even if you have these these elements in the system, whether it's, you know, a ferrite on the cable or whether it's a filter on the board, um, it's still beneficial to maybe do something to try and prevent the noise pickup on a cable in the first place. And when we talk noise pickup, right, I mean, there's the conducted noise that's transmitted over the cable, but then there's the possibility also of receiving radiated emissions in the cable, and then that transmits into the mm -hmm. circuit as well. Do we really care about the fact that mm -hmm. the cable picks up noise or... If it's really extreme, do we then have to say, well, okay, we have to shield this this cable and apply some shielding throughout the system? It, again, it depends on your application. Uh, lots of the products I worked with are automotive products. So there are standard practice in the automotive field. So they will always try to use uh, shielding um, and, and the, the box they developed is always uh, so, you know like solid metal enclosure with gaskets making sure that uh, the lid and the and the the box is is really uh, sealed in terms of rf and um, and then as you said they would focus both on the board design which is future and then they also need to focus on the connector design especially when the cable goes into the connector and then connecting to the PCB, that little bit of area is often uh, overlooked by the engineers. And then, so in those kind of applications, you are using a, a shielded cable. So you really uh, de-risk um, uh, your, your product in terms of radiation emission particularly. And uh, so that's really good practice, but not every product's application uses, as I mentioned, um, if you work in a sort of home appliance application where bomb cost is really the determining factor in, in your design. And, and perhaps, as I mentioned, the, the, the cost, the weight, and uh, the bending ratio of the cable, all these constraints uh, basically means you can't use shielded cable. Then you really need to rethink the approach uh, when it comes to cable and, 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 and filtering. So I, I uh, heard you bring up the uh, I heard you bring up the issue with uh, like a bomb bomb cost. Um, I think this is an area where that transition to high volume, especially in an area like consumer appliances, um, that is something that could go uh, or create constraints that uh, oppose maybe some of the best practices in EMI, EMC, and can drive designers to do things that then compromise the system. Maybe it is reducing layer count. Maybe it's compromising and going for lower quality components. Because, I mean, it's understandable, right? You, you're you going to produce a million devices. That extra dollar that you might spend on a better common mode choke, let's say, or, or whatever it is, or a transformer or whatever, that adds up when you're producing a million you know, million devices a year. Yes. So I think there's a big incentive for companies to do whatever they can to try and reduce some of those costs. What What would you say is maybe a better strategy to ensure that you do get a compliant product um, without just compromising on component costs and aiming for the lowest component cost? Is there something that needs to happen maybe on the design side that maybe it makes the design more difficult or more complex? but is actually beneficial and can allow you to maybe use a lower cost component if it does you know, require uh, this level of noise suppression that we're talking about? That's a very good question, Zach. Um, I, I think there's, a, a, again, another interesting uh, story to share. Um, I recently did a, a, a conversation with uh, Robert Ferenick on YouTube. Um, it's about um, EMI troubleshooting on immunity. I, I did. I did see that, and I just. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell the viewers we'll actually link to that in the show notes. So I would encourage anyone to go watch it because it is an interesting conversation. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly uh, what what we're discussing now because uh, it's a it's a, it's a 
company that makes some um, you know beacon uh, fire alarm uh, products and they they are not really uh, large volume manufacturers but of course being a small and medium company bomb course is also a very big uh, design uh, concern when, when they design products and um, because of the supply chain disruptions we are all facing i think everyone i spoke to have the same issue um, they ended up <laughs> they ended up having to uh, select a new platform and but um but of course um uh, redesign the whole system uh, comes comes at a cost so to to really to to really avoid redesigning the whole system what they come up with was just designing a daughter board uh with a new chip on top and then they they sold the daughter board uh, to the to the old um a motherboard PCB, and by doing so, they thought there's really no risk. Um, so they sent the board for immunity test, and then it failed the immunity test. And it was a really, really good troubleshooting uh, case for me because um, I knew they cannot afford to use expensive uh, materials or expensive solutions in that case. So really, the task is to how to find the lowest cost solution for the application. And we were lucky, really lucky. In the end, we found a, a Ferrite plate, which happened to have the exactly the same pinout uh, to their, their, their daughter board. So then putting that Ferrite plate in between the two boards, we solved the problem. And uh, it's, it's also an interesting uh, case study because that just demonstrates a, a, a very good point in, in terms of EMI troubleshooting is, I would say, uh, 70, perhaps 70%, I would say 70% of the EMI issues are somehow related to resonance. You know, we talk about cable resonance. Uh, you, you've got resonance between PCBs. And if you have a fully enclosed uh, a box, you probably will have a cavity resonance. So, and then you ha if you have two large systems uh, installed in, on a factory site and then linked with power cable or signal cable, then you've got these two systems basically have a resonance. So lots of resonance issues in, 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 the, in the field of EM, in EMC. Um, so if, if, I, if I want to give um, uh, advice to manufacturers in general is, is when you do a design, don't rush to, because in that case, the, the company rushed to manufacture thousands or tens of thousands of, of these little PCBs. So there is really no way back. So, so my advice would always be, to to look at the system and 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 review it and and w when you review the system uh, you should take the emc into consideration at least you should know there is a potential risk associated with this new change and when you do the risk analysis you put the risk you put the likelihoods and then you put some solutions just in case right so often yeah let's um, you know, fingers crossed, we, we don't have any issue. But if there is issue, do you have the solution for it? Or if you don't have the solution for it, do you have anybody in your contact list that you can quickly contact to make sure that this person is available to solve your problems? So these are the, the uh, you know, the advice I would be, I would give to manufacturers in general. Mm. So the, the case that you just described sounds really interesting because I think it's one of those things about resonance that even if you know about it in terms of the structure of a PCB, it's still something that can happen in this case as we're talking in, in the system. And I, it sounds like the, the resonance in this case was between two boards because you had a daughter board. And so you create essentially an open on the edges, resonant cavity that's bounded by two, by, uh, two surfaces. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the takeaway there in terms of what the solution was is that by adding the ferrite plate between the two uh, be between the two boards, as you described, I think that's how you described it, essentially yeah. what you've done is you've pushed those lowest order resonances up to much higher frequencies. And so now the dominant noise frequency range where the noise is being generated can no longer excite a resonance in that, in that region. Mm -hmm. was, is that the, the correct way to think about the solution? Yeah, that's an interesting point, the way you interpreted it. It might be true, I think, but the way I thought at the time, at least, was because because it, the, the resonance structure has to be an LC tank circuit to, you know, 
to make it resonate. So the C really depends on the simple equation of uh, any capacitance, right? You've got the area of the the PCB or, or, or the, the surface, and then you've got the height, and then you've got the dielectric, and you can sort of work out the capacitance of this structure. And the L, and in this case, I worked out is between is is the the link the the the, the leads or the legs of the of the PCB to uh, between the two boards. So that um, perhaps gives about ten nanohenry inductance in that case. And then you you can work out the resonant frequency in that case. So when putting the ferrite, you the way you interpret it is is you you ex basically push the frequency into a higher um, band. But um, the way I treated it is is um, I think it's always important to 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 remember that a ferrite is not an a hundred percent inductive component. In fact, it is more resistive as a lossy component compared with the inductive uh, component of a ferrite. So I, I at the time I thought it's because I used the, the lossy um, feature of a ferrite, which is to add more resistive into this LC circuit to really dampen the uh, the resonant frequency. So that's how I interpreted it. But um, the, the, the problem was solved by, by this application. But yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to really see what is exactly the, 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 the mechanism of, of this resonance and is it we, we really dampen it or is it we push the frequency to a higher fr uh, frequency band? Mm. So I was thinking about this in terms of the, the wave propagation mm between the two the two portions of the system um so you know even if you have large pcbs and they're open at the edges you can still excite a cavity mode it's just that that cavity mode could be you know very lossy mm. um and then by changing the geometry you change the cavity cavity resonance structure but i guess if you're at lower frequencies really you could think of it then as a lumped circuit as you've said like an lc circuit and so then what you've just said makes total sense, right? You're adding in some some loss into the system, and then that would uh, essentially decrease the Q factor mm. of that LC tank circuit that you have unintentionally created through this daughter mm. board configuration. Um, but I guess if you look at it from a wave perspective, right, that ferrite is still a lossy material. Mm. So you've also added in some yeah. loss. So, I mean, maybe it is mm. both. I guess, you know, you would need direct measurements of the electric field or the the magnetic field in that structure yeah. to to really say which is the dominant mechanism of of noise reduction yeah. i i think this is a really really good discussion Zach, because um what we just did was actually trying to explain a, a phenomenon from <clears throat> both sides so when i say both sides we all know that uh, lots of engineers are more comfortable with a lumped circuit element analysis so in which case they use alc Perhaps with some resistors as a damping element in their in their circuit design, and and often these engineers are probably uh, uh, power electronics and guys. Whereas the way you see it, you treat it as a proper transmission line, and that's lots of that's the way lots of RF engineers and, and high speed circuit designers think, and and I, I really appreciate it because as as we just discussed at the very beginning. I think understanding the, the first principle, understanding the basics is really, really important when it comes to EMI problem solving and, uh, and CP design. So um, I do encourage our listeners, our audience to really expand the view because don't, I mean, RLC circuit design of view is, is often adequate and it's, it's, it's simple, it's easy. But when it comes to high speed design, you really need to understand how the wave propagates, as you mentioned, um, you know, it, it, it depends on the number of the rounds of, of a wave action inside your transmission line. Then you can really have you know, the resonance ripples on your voltage or current waveform. So um, I think if 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 you really understand the basics from both points of view, it will help a lot when it comes to EM, EMC troubleshooting and also product designing. Yeah, that's funny that you bring up the the RF thinking because a lot of stuff that that I do is is RF um, plus uh, some some high speed digital, and I actually got into this from optics. Mm -hmm. So literally everything is is wave propagation. Yeah. So I guess I, I kind of come by it naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but that's I think that's one of those areas where um, there 
could be some better education around it. And, um, you know, when I was, I, I used to teach at a university and, um, I think wave phenomena was always a little difficult for engineers. Most of my students were engineers. Um, and so I was teaching physics. And so of course we have to get into to wave phenomena. And um, I think that was one of the areas where it was, it was a bit difficult because it requires so much visualization in your mind. You can't see touch it all the time. Whereas with a lot of things that engineers do in a physics class, like in a lab, it, it really is tangible. The, wave propagating waves creating resonances is not tangible mm -hmm. i mean you, you it's so much and there's math that goes into it and i think that can be a bit a bit daunting mm -hmm. now you mentioned early uh when we got started um that uh you know being at university um maybe there is more that the university uh structure of an engineering education could do to aid emi emc uh uh education or training mm -hmm. um you know, is wave propagation part of that? To, to what extent do you s see wave propagation being part of that? And maybe are, are there some other areas where the university system could could maybe do better? So, so um, I have to admit, when I was in, uh, in, in, in my uh, uh, undergraduate uh, degree, we had transmission line courses. And to be honest, I, I, I didn't understand it. And I didn't see the application of that. I think the biggest gap is you know, you get taught a lot in a university, but which of these knowledge is really linked to the real life engineering? So, so if, if you're not using this knowledge, you quickly forget. That's just simple because we're all human beings. We forget if we don't practice. Um, and it, especially, as you said, um, the wave propagation, because it's just so abstract in the sense that we cannot see it, we cannot capture it. But, but that's just the, 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 the truth, this is the nature. We cannot see wave in the air, although it's there. We cannot observe energy um, movement. Uh, we, the only tool we have is really the voltage meter and the current meter. But according to Maxwell's equations, we know that these are just the next layer below the Maxwell, you know, the wave uh, layer. So how to link the, these two layers is going to be a, a huge task. And, and, and to, to explain it is, is, is difficult, to demonstrate it, and also how to link this to real-life engineering. I, I think that's going to be a huge challenge for, for, for university lecturers and professors, I guess. One criticism, or maybe not criticism, but one commentary I had uh, just recently saw from someone on my, on my LinkedIn um, that is related to this is uh, test and measurement mm -hmm. and that universities probably don't do enough with test and measurement. And I'm going to admit, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was doing my undergrad and then later my graduate uh, work, um, I didn't get enough exposure to test equipment until like I started doing research and I had to jump in and learn it and like break open the manual, read the theory of operation and like, you, you had to you had to jump in the pool and learn to swim, mm -hmm. as as we say. Yes, um, and it it forces you to fail fast and learn from your mistakes quickly. And then, of course, there's you know a lot of hand holding for the first couple of months where you're you know really learning to use some of this equipment at a deep level. Mm -hmm. do, do you think you know universities should have just like I don't know a vector network analyzer course, <laughs> or like an oscilloscope <laughs> course? I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, as, as we just said, um, uh, having the course is one thing, but how to link that to real life engineering is another thing. I, I think a good demonstration would be, uh, again, it depends on, on the funding of a university. If it's a well-funded university, you can always afford to buy a very, very expensive high speed, I don't know, 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz oscilloscope. That would be a very uh, good demonstration because if you look at, let's say, typical uh, uh, capacitor discharge, it's just like give you the exponential curve, but with high speed digital uh, oscilloscope, you might be able to see that, you know, the, the wave action we, we talked about uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, things like that to give students better understanding. Uh, and in fact, perhaps, again, that's a good example of linking a simple RC circuit to a, a, a transmission line circuit. Uh, things like that, I think would be quite demonstrative 
uh, in, in the sense of educating the students. Mm. Well, it's, it's good to hear somebody kind of validate that because I've always believed that uh, PCB designers should know something about test and measurement, um, at least which instruments somebody else should use mm. to maybe diagnose the problem that they might have created on a circuit board. Um, even just knowing which measurements are important for which potential problems I think mm. is really valuable. Even if you don't know all the ins and outs of that particular piece of equipment, you can at least point yourself or point a colleague in the right mm. direction to then try and figure out some kind of solution to the problem. Yes. So speaking of this point, do you know, do you happen to know everyone, anyone in the, say, United States or, or just in the world in general? who's been quite active in terms of promoting uh, testing skills uh, or, or how to set up tests properly and things like that. Because the reason I ask is, uh, I know, like, back in, you know, a, a, a few years ago, I think one of the person I, I, I admired a lot, even though I haven't met him personally yet, is is uh, Mr. Doug Smith. He He's a very good EMI and ESD problem solver. And I really like his book. Uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, it's High Speed Measurement or something. That's that's his only book published. Um, and you can't. I don't think you can buy the brand new book these days. You can buy them from the second hand market. And that book really is really focusing on um, the the test and measurement uh, in terms of high speed design, as as you you pointed out. And also there are other people in the in the analog world. Uh, I think one guy died uh, a few years back and and he basically wrote a book and it's, I think it's an EDN series uh, talking about how to troubleshoot on a on a circuit you know these are very practical but if you really read into it you learn a lot because it's everything's practical I think yeah there there are three people I'm thinking of two mm. of whom have actually been guests this year mm. on on the podcast so we had Eric Bogatin who yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with and, yeah, and yeah. Um, Heidi yeah. Barnes yeah. and she and I were actually talking talking a lot of power integrity uh, okay. um, but the third person I'm thinking of is Steve Sandler yes that's yeah I'm thinking of a uh, uh, Steve Sandler yeah Eric I think he's everywhere because he's just has a, a such a broad and in-depth knowledge so i know eric mainly because he's a cp kind of expertise um yeah but uh i don't really think him as a just focusing on the em, EM uh, well, high speed measurement side but steve sander definitely he is a typical uh guy right. on, in this field yeah i agree mm. well steve sandler if you're listening we haven't had you on the podcast yet <laughs> so uh Get at me on LinkedIn and yeah. uh, we'll have you on to talk about <laughs> this stuff. I think yeah. that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. And then um, yeah. uh, who who did you mention? Uh, you cut out just a, briefly there, um, but who was the person that you had mentioned? Oh, so yeah. So it's uh, Doug Smith and he he wrote a book called uh, okay. uh, High Speed uh, Measurement. I, I will provide the, the book maybe uh, so we can put the contents in, 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 in the notes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely link to that in the mm. show notes. So anybody who's listening uh, can uh, can go and check out that book. Mm. Um, and uh, if you send me a link, I'll probably buy it this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, um, we're, we're getting low on time here, mm. but um, this has been a really interesting discussion. And I always love to talk about, uh, you know, SIPI, mm. EMI, EMC with, with uh, other experts mm. in the field. So this has been very illuminating. And... Um, Definitely valuable to look beyond mm -hmm. just the PCB because even though your solution may be at the board level, the problem might not be. Yeah, uh, it's it's been a pleasure for me as well, and uh, I hope the conversation really can spark some, in you know, sparks uh, within the engineering community. And uh, yeah, and beyond the PCB, we have uh, many many interesting things to talk about. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Min Zhang, uh, independent uh, EMC consultant based in the UK. And uh, this has been very illuminating. Um, definitely would love to have you on again sometime in the future. Oh, that would be my uh, pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. 
And uh, to everybody who's listening out there uh, and watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to uh, get access to all of the upcoming podcast episodes. Make sure to hit the like button. Uh, Make sure to leave a comment if you have any questions. Um, We can always uh, take those on LinkedIn or we can take them uh, in the comment section on YouTube. And... uh, Make sure to check out the show notes on the Altium website. There are going to be a lot of great links, and uh, we will make sure to, of course, link to that book that you mentioned, because I always encourage people, go get a great book to read. Um, Last but not least, uh, everybody that's listening, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you for the next episode.